Welcome back everyone. Glad you decided to join me for this presentation on sampling designs. Always an intriguing topic. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to review the concepts presented in chapter 11 and look at the different types of, types of sampling designs that are used to get uh, in, solicit individuals to participate in research and talk about the difference between probability and non-probability sampling designs, which are important in the methodological processes. As we're developing our research proposal or designing our research study, we actually have to consider who will be our sample population. And just like all the other steps in this process, they all kind of link together. So we have to think about what our research question is, and then we think have to think about who would be able to provide us the information needed to answer that research question? That's the one thing that we have to start considering when we're talking about a sampling population or who's going to participate in our study. So the things that we have to consider when selecting a sample population, like I said, is who can best provide information, meaning the data, that will answer our research question? Do I have access to this population? And if the answer is yes, then the question becomes, how will I solicit and access the participants? If you don't have access to the population necessary to answer your research question, you're going to either have to change your research question or you're going to have to discover another way to access a population that can then maybe link you to the population necessary to provide that data for you. There are several methods for soliciting and accessing participants of your study. So once you answer these first two questions, then you have to decide which is going to be the most logical or the most feasible method for soliciting participants. So let's begin by actually looking at some of the terms and defining those terms, which include population, sampling plant frame, and then the different sampling procedures. The population, that's actually the totality of persons or objects with which our research study is concerned. Okay, so it's however we define our study population, the results of our study will only apply to that population from which this, our sample was drawn. So we define who the population is. If we're talking about a community, then it's the population of individuals with that characteristic who resides in that community. Whatever that is, the population includes the total number of persons or objects that we would be doing our research study on or that our research study is concerned with. So the sampling frame is actually composed of all the individual people or units that have been selected from, that pop, from the population. So obtaining the sampling frame is often one of the hardest parts of a research study. Determining the sampling frame is a process that may go from a broad concept to specificity of the population to select from. You know, you can see based on the example given in the book, the difficulty um, a researcher may have in actually defining the population and obtaining that sampling frame that's necessary. So sometimes do you have to tweak your population, you have to tweak your sampling frame till you can actually get it down to those individuals who participate in your study that will actually be able to answer your question. There's two different paradigms for sampling procedures, and the first one is probability. And when we talk about probability sampling, we're actually talking about when all the units or the people in that sampling frame have the same known, known chance of being selected for the sample. So probability means chance and is based on some form of random procedure. But remember, when we talk about random in research, we're not talking about a haphazard method. We're actually talking about a very systematic, planned way to randomly select individuals. So a probability sampling has a random component to it, and this is this allows everybody in that sampling frame to have the same opportunity to be selected. Non-probability sampling is when not all people in the sampling frame have the same probability of being included. Um, there are four types of non-probability sampling procedures also. And we're going to look at the probability and the non-probability sampling procedures. But just to know that probability sampling increases the ability to have external validity or be able to take those results and 
apply it beyond just the sample population to the entire population. Non-probability sampling procedures prevent us from doing that. When we have non-probability sampling procedures used in our research methodology, then any of our findings that we have, any of the data that comes out about those people in our sample can only be linked back to the people in our sample. We can't make statements beyond that. In probability sampling, we actually have simple random sampling, um, and this does require a sampling frame. And this is the one that most of us are familiar with, and it's just similar to the old fishbowl. Everybody's name in the sampling frame can go into a fishbowl, and everybody has the same chance of being selected. It's like rolling dice and the chance that you have of having a five or a six. So simple random sampling is one way to do that. There are actually computer programs now that will generate a um, random table of numbers, um, other ways to assign randomness to the individuals that you're picking. You can also have systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, or cluster random sampling. And again, that simple random sampling, it's just a one-stage probability sampling procedure in which all members of the population are selected one at a time without a chance of being selected again until the desired sample size is obtained. Now, you can actually have simple random sampling with replacement, and there's reasons for doing that, and then the name goes back into the bowl. But this is just the very basic, simple approach. One-stage probability sampling, dump everybody's name into the bowl and start choosing until you actually get the sample, that you're the sample size that you need. In systematic random sampling, which also requires a sampling frame, it's a um, one-stage probability sampling procedure in which every person at a designated interval in a specific population is selected and included in the research study sample. So if you have a very large sampling frame, you can actually choose a random number, say number nine, and then you could say every ninth individual in that sampling frame would be selected and that would be your random sampling. You started with a random number and then you followed that nth number all the way down until you got your designated sample. What you have to be aware with aware of here is that there's not bias. If you're sampling, say you're going to sample existing data and you're going to look at documentation of clients in a certain organization and you want to do a systematic random sampling of that, what you have to make sure is that those documents are not in an alphabetical order are not in an order of service or some order that would introduce a bias. They have to be truly random. So even if you're using the systematic random sampling approach and you randomly select a number and then choose every nth number based on that, you have to make sure that there's whatever you're choosing is not in some predetermined format um, alpha, alphabetizing them by city or something like that. Otherwise, it's not random. Stratified random sampling includes, it's a one-stage probability sampling procedure also, but it's in which the population is divided into two or more strata to be sampled separately. So using simple random or systematic random sampling techniques, but you actually divide into strata. And this is actually done in um, census when we're um, gathering census data or um, looking at larger geographic regions, states, and you can actually divide the state into certain strata, north, south, east, west, and then you can employ a systematic random or si simple random or systematic random sampling techniques within that. So it's a way to break down a very large population and still obtain that random sample that you need. And then cluster random sampling again goes along the same designs as the previous one, but it doesn't require a sampling frame. And it's actually a multi-stage probability random sampling procedure. The population is divided into groups or clusters rather than the individuals and are selected for inclusion in the sample. So it's again, it's those clusters, those groups, and it's, it's a staged way to do it. When we talk about non-probability sampling methods, we're going to be talking about what's called availability or convenience sampling, purposive sampling, quota sampling, and snowball sampling. 
First of all, availability or convenience sampling is exactly, that's just exactly what it is. There's no specific characteristics to your sample population. It's the simplest form of non-probability and it just involves anybody first come first serve um, to be able to answer your questions on your questionnaire or participate in your study. You can stand out on the corner at the university and ask students questions about how the university is run. And that's going to be an availability sample. It's just going to be whoever happens to stop by the corner that you're standing on to be able to answer that. So there's no characteristics specifically about the sample population you're looking for. And we use propulsive sampling and when we want to choose a particular sample and we choose who we want to participate. Nothing's random. So oftentimes we're actually looking for those individuals who have specific characteristics. We may be looking for individuals who are homeless who reside in Dallas County. And we're going to actually select those individuals who meet those qualifiers. And so that's going to be a purposive sampling design. And it's non-probability. There's no, there's no randomness to it to who we choose. Quota sampling is based on theory. And we decide who we should include on in our sample. So many, many of a certain type of person is there. Uh, relevant characteristics are identified. Uh, one of the ways to think about quota sampling is if you determine that you're you're going to survey individuals who live in a specific zip code in Dallas County and you look at census data and it's determined that in the overall population there is 40% Caucasian who reside in that zip code and there's 60% African American. You want to select your sample to meet those percentages. So if you're going to select 100 participants, you're going to want 40 of them to be Caucasian and 60 of them to be African American because then that's representative of the individuals who are there. Oftentimes you'll see quota sampling when we're dealing with different minority populations and vulnerable populations, which of course is what social workers deal with because we will actually oversample certain populations because we're less likely to get participation from those from those individuals. So we'll oversample so that we can actually get the percentages that we need. So this is a form of quota sampling. And the last way of doing non-probability sampling is snowball sampling. And this is where when you identify individuals to be in your study and they have very specific characteristics, then you actually ask them to identify other individuals with similar characteristics. So that's useful to locate those individuals who are from very divergent populations, uh, difficult to identify, hard to gain access to. Those individuals who share characteristics may actually be able to connect you with under other individuals who'd be willing to participate. So this is snowball sampling. Very common in qualitative research, as is availability, purposive, and quota sampling, except in availability, you will find a lot of it in survey research and purposive also. So that's just a brief rundown of the different types of sampling procedures, the difference between non-probability and probability. You can see further definitions, explanations of these and examples of these in the textbook. The non-probability sampling is often what we use in social work research. It's availability, purposive, quota, snowball sampling, because we're, we tend to work with those populations that are much more vulnerable. And most of, if we're in practice, most of the research we're conducting is going to be engaging the clients that we work with. So that's actually going to fall into that purposive sampling. Probability sampling is an important sampling technique that's used, again, when Whenever you're wanting to increase validity in your study design and when we talk about group research methods we'll talk about validity internal validity and external validity but probability sampling helps to get a sample population who can participate in your study that will be representative of a larger population with the idea here that that sample population, the data and what you learn about them can then be applied back to that larger population. But several things have to happen for that to come about. But that's the main difference between probability sampling and non-probability sampling and the methods that we use to obtain individuals to participate in our study, which again is what the hardest thing to do. You can design the best study out there, but to get individuals to participate to solicit and to get invite them to be able to participate in your study is very challenging. 
So we actually compromise a lot of the rigor in terms of sampling procedures in order to get those individuals to participate. We may go from a random sample to actually go to purposive sampling because we need uh, more individuals to participate than we're able to do through a random sampling design. So that just kind of wraps up the simple perspective of sampling methods.